Welcome to Stir It Up. Today I have Dr. Lily Pobi. Dr. Lily Pobi is a psychologist mm -hmm. who's been practicing for 13 plus years. Yeah. Uh, Lily has done a lot of work in mental health research yeah. and is quite passionate about her field. So one Absolutely. of the people who went into psychology because you love it. Yes, I, it, it really was because I loved it. <laughs> yes. And so far, staying on course? Oh, yes. No, no, Kev, no Ben. No, Kev, no <laughs> we, we, like, full steam ahead. Yeah. Welcome to Stare It Up. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This season, as we've talked about, we're talking about emotions. And Lily and I are going to talk about one of the many emotions that uh, feature in our lives. So almost a year ago, a dear friend of mine and I were having one of our early morning conversations on a Sunday morning. It was a video call. Um, and we were in the throes of, you know, talking about some of the challenges that we had both been facing, facing in our life. Because it was really crazy, crazy times for both of us. And he says, Kriya, I no longer feel shame. And when he said this, I still remember very vividly my heart bursting wide open and almost like feeling a bit hot in my cheeks at the time mm -hmm. and getting teary. And then the relief I felt mm -hmm. at the time. And today you and I are going to be talking about shame and guilt. Yeah. Two rather powerful emotions, sometimes almost paralyzing. And we know that often guilt is around feeling, feeling bad about things that we've done. Mm -hmm. um, and shame is normally around, you know, how you evaluate yourself and how you see yourself, right? Yeah. And so we're going to kind of waddle through these waters together. Okay. I think it might be potentially heavy. Yes. At some point in time. Yes. Um, I will tell you something that I read. Um, I think it was a guy called... Jeremy Sutton, and he had he was quoting Dr. Brene Brown. So Brene mm -hmm. Brown is one of the my famous Instagram. Uh, she talks about various you know psychological topics, and yeah. and one of the things she talks a lot about is shame and 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 fear. Yeah, and he talks about how most of us you know, carry out of fear and avoid shame because it makes us uncomfortable. Yes, um, but the truth is. That's where the power comes from the fact that it makes us uncomfortable. Yeah. So maybe we demystify some of that today. Yes. yes. And open it up. So let's keep it going. Okay. And I will <laughs> dig in. So do you want to start from what emotions are? Is that a good place to start? Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, it's a word that we tend to use often, isn't it? I'm feeling emotional. I don't know what my emotions are or the, I'm feeling this kind of emotion or that kind of emotion. So it's, it's a feeling essentially, but then most of it is really hardwired in, in our instincts. You know, we are born with certain emotions. We are, we are taught through life how to express or experience other emotions. So really emotions are our feeling way, if I should put it that way, of relaying what's going on within, within us internally. Helps us to, to show when things please us, or when things frighten us, or when things upset us. Those things that help you to regulate or to express what's going on internally, okay. we would often talk about as emotions. Um, and as I said, we are born with certain emotions, right? Every baby, fresh baby as they're born, comes with there are six what we call primary emotions. So there's anger, there's fear, there's even disgust. Babies start off with disgust. Um, How does that show up? 
You can, usually they are, you can see from the the expression on their faces. Yeah, some kind <laughs> of I'm not doing this. up face, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's mostly to do with taste okay. or things that they see oh, or they they, yeah. they view around them. So yeah. those things are naturally within us. So, um, as I said, there are six: anger, fear, disgust, but there's also happiness and sadness and even surprise. That's one of our core emotions. When something startles you or something takes you aback, yeah. we, we we show surprise. Most of those things we can see even on a baby's face. Yeah. But through those six emotions, we di divert into all those other range of feelings that we tend to have. And some of it we learn from our experiences. Some of them are taught to us as we grow up. So, yeah, emotions really help us to navigate our world, to show what we enjoy, what we don't enjoy, what we should be careful of, what we should engage with. Yeah. So what would shame or guilt be one of those primary emotions then? No, not quite. They, shame and guilt derive from the primary emotions. Okay. So some people actually describe them as secondary emotions. Okay. Yeah. So you'll find that um, something like shame can grow through sadness. Okay. You know, it's, um, it can evolve, let's say. Sadness can evolve into shame and guilt. Sometimes surprise can evolve into guilt as well. So those other emotions develop from these core emotions. But shame and guilt, they, we need to learn shame and guilt because it's not something that we are born with. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's interesting. <laughs> okay. So now let's dig into shame and guilt. <laughs> What's the difference? So those are two emotions. Shame and guilt are two emotions that often um, we, we may use interchangeably or a lot of people don't, they are not able to differentiate between the two very keenly when you are feeling them. Um, but they are different, although interconnected. Shame usually has to do with our assessment of self, our feelings of either inadequacy, our feelings of um, uh, less or lower self-worth, our sense of identity, the right. core of who we think of ourselves as. So it's a very much um, internally reflected uh, process or ex experience. Whereas guilt has to do with what we perceive as our actions or what, what we think we should have done if we didn't do. Um, and often those things are, are based on our moral or idealistic beliefs about what it means to be us or to even be a person. So you may feel guilt about not doing what, let's say, a mother is expected to do or as a good employer or employee, we may feel guilt yeah. about some of those things. So shame is a, is a, is a self-directed emotion about us as our person and guilt is about the behaviors that we think we need to show. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it, it's interesting that you say that because what, what I hear you say is with shame, it's more from, from me as an individual. It's not based on an action, right? It's, it's yes. not always based on an action, yes. right? Whereas yes. guilt is normally based on something I may or may not have done, but it's... It, it, it's, it's maybe it's more output based maybe. Yes, okay. in a lot of ways it is output. And the core thing is about an idealized Self. sense of what, what it means to be who you are or okay. who you think of yourself. And if you, you think of yourself as lacking personally or um, inherently in certain areas, some of the emotions you'll feel could be shame. Okay. Um, but if you think of yourself as not behaving in the ways that you, you are required to behave or that's proper, or you're doing things that you know you shouldn't be doing or you feel you shouldn't be doing, then the guilt emotions are the ones that would dominate. Okay. Yeah. So now, is there a progression where one leads to the other or one births another. How, how are they related when you think about the yeah. two? So, you, uh, you know, as I said from the beginning, they are very interconnected. And that is because when your behaviors are especially consistently different from what you think they should be, then you start to think of yourself as being flawed. There must be something wrong with me or something inadequate in me. 
that makes me keep behaving that way. And that then births shame, or it can birth shame. So often guilt can lead to shame um, if it isn't processed properly. And it leads to shame, which then sort of, it, it, it has the potential to, to paralyze us even more and make us keep doing the things that we think we should be doing or not doing the things that we should be doing. And that becomes a sort of vicious cycle where the person behaves in ways that they do not like or they they, they have problems with. And it feeds that negative self-perception, okay. which then leads to more shame. So they are so interconnected that sometimes it isn't easy to separate to one from, them the, from the other. Exactly, because okay. sometimes people don't even recognize that there's first shame before it moves to get, I mean, first guilt before it moves to shame, shame. or whatever. It comes together. Okay. So yeah, it, it takes some time to reflect and think through what is it that I'm feeling? Why am I feeling this way? What, what led to these kinds of feelings and so on? Then you can look at where one starts and where the other ends. So, so, so maybe let's begin to look at some scenarios, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of the time quantifying it and bringing it to real life makes this easier for people to yeah. comprehend and kind of see themselves in it a bit more. Yeah. So let's look at some scenarios um, that birth guilt as an emotion, right? Um, and so I'll throw some scenarios at you. Okay. And then, and then we talk about it, right? So drugs and addiction. Mm -hmm. So imagine someone has a, a drug addiction. How does that, how do they navigate that from a guilt perspective? Mm -hmm. And how do their caregivers, yeah, for example, their, fa their mother and their father navigate that? Because yeah. I think there might be feelings of guilt from both parties within yes. that context. Yes. And th that's, that's entirely possible for the, the feelings to come from both sides. But, let, but starting with the individual who is struggling with their addictive behavior, um, often addiction tends to creep up on us. It mostly, it maybe is as a result of the way movies tend to portray things, but nobody sets out to be addicted. Absolutely. You know? yeah. Nobody starts off. And, and even though many people would say, oh, but you know this is a drug that is not good. Uh, why did you even start but, it? You know? But nobody starts it out thinking, oh, I know this is bad, but I just want to see it. Yeah. Most of the time there's a need or a perceived need, um, something that the people are maybe struggling with, something they're trying to avoid or not to think about or whatever. Addiction starts from a place of sort of trying to figure things out. And before you know it, it becomes a dependency that you are struggling to kick um, or a habit that you're struggling to kick. There's so much guilt because the narrative that is usually out there is that you did it to yourself. You should have known better, should have stopped sooner, you should have sought help sooner. There's all of these things that we hear being said about other people, even if people don't know about our own addiction. Yes. We hear how they react to what other people go through. And we, th we, we, we start to um, identify with those kinds of perceptions because there's always that need to um, and to ensure that everything is sort of smooth around and us. And conform. And conform to and what's acceptable. Ex ex exactly, exactly. And so those things can really drive a person to feel so guilty. However, addiction is it's a disease. It's a, it's a problem that you need support with. And it's many people will tell you it is something that you're always going to have to learn to manage, yeah. you know? And so when you do not get the appropriate help to manage things like that, then you feel guilty because you're not able to kick that what people say is just a habit which you should stop. Um, but you're trying, but it's not working, right? Mm -hmm. you, you've got to get the, the, the consistent help to be able to kick it. And that takes a lot of breaking down you know the 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 first or the first step of addiction is unearthing it, because it thrives in secrecy, yes. and so you need to open it up. You need to admit that this is what my life is, what my reality is, and that comes with a lot of guilt because you suddenly feel like all these eyes are looking Look at, at you, you, isn't it? That oh, so all along, and and this is especially when 
we we have we don't have that stereotypical somebody who is an addict looking and kept being um out of control so it's like sexual addictions that are hidden for example yes. gambling, gambling addictions, addictions i mean yes. even things like addictions to cannabis and things yes. like you don't you don't always see Get, it yeah. but then people may be struggling and yeah. um, so it, it can result in a lot of guilt and a, and a lot of shame because inherently you feel as though i should be able to do better yes. or i should know better but then on the other side of it parenting or the, the spouse of the person or whoever whoever else is in their circle mm-hmm. there can also be a lot of guilt a lot of shame in the sense that um people start to say well shouldn't i have noticed how could i have helped to prevent this um or what what do i need to say or do to help them do better and things like that. So there's all of that shame as well, especially when it comes to parenting. Society would say you failed as a parent. If especially as child, a mother, because normally the mothers mother. are, when a child is doing well, oh, it's the father yeah. and the mother. Yeah. Everybody yeah. gets some mm-hmm. credit. Mm-hmm. Yes. But when you're not doing so, oh, where's, where's your mother? Mm-hmm. Where's your mother moment yeah. until you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So th- that's guilt. And honestly, it's not always external. Some Sometimes it's internal. As yeah. parents, too, you can ask yourself questions when like, did, gosh, did I, I miss wrong? something? Is it because I was working too much? Is it because I didn't discipline them enough? Yes. Or did I discipline them too, too much? much? Or it's all of those things that can result in us feeling like, you know, we've missed something. Yes. And so it's our fault, or at least partly our fault. And that's where guilt thrives, isn't it? When we take on responsibility in its entirety for behaviors and I mean outcomes or behaviors that we have been a part of. And, that's and the are thing. they within our control might be a question we should be asking. Sometimes, but not always. Okay. Sometimes. Now, let's give that worst case scenario where you really were not a mother who was present or you you over disciplined your child or whatever. Sometimes there are situations that you think maybe you could have done better. Yeah. But what happens with guilt is that you it becomes a like a totalizing picture of what your life is. You only see that tiny aspect and it consumes everything else. Everybody as human as we are makes mistakes. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. And sometimes us recognizing our mistakes means that we learn to do better in the future or look at ways to make amends or whatever. That. But guilt means you sit and you wallow in the what ifs and then the should haves. You know, and that doesn't help the situation because all you're seeing is the negative. Yeah. Another scenario would be mothers abandoning young children. You know, uh, they're mothers who have kids and for all sorts of reasons are yeah. not able to care for the kids, whether it's because they're too young or they don't have the financial means or, you know, they were not ready. Yeah. And another caregiver takes, you know, charge of the child so they can go to school yeah. and there's even mothers who are not always present right yeah. as as working mothers sometimes you feel like you're not present enough yeah there's that sense of disconnect with yeah. your child mm. how does guilt show up in this and 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 what are your thoughts there yeah it, it, it really also has to do with the ways in which we talk about some of those things, right? right? Because you'll find, let's say, like the examples you gave a mother who needs to work or who wants to work, even if she doesn't need to. Yeah. As rare yeah. as that is in this part of the world, <laughs> sometimes it does happen. Some mothers don't need to, but they would like, like to, to work, right? Um, or you have situations where she, the mother wasn't ready to have that child and so needed to give them a... Uh, use of language around things like that to say the mother abandoned the child is very strong and it carries a certain perception you know a mother having to give up her child or having to balance it balance motherhood with work motherhood with sometimes being a caregiver for an elderly parent or something or you know that splitting of who you need to be can be something that is difficult to juggle And so there's always this worry about you being stretched too thin or being pulled in so many different directions that you don't feel as though you're giving adequate attention to each side of it. Mm. And we feel the most guilt when it comes to our children because we, they depend on us in a lot of ways. Mm. We are supposed to be the ones who have it together to teach them how to be good adults and all yeah. of that. So that can carry a lot of guilt. And it can, carry, it, it can mean that 
if we are not um, careful or we don't manage it properly, then our interactions with our children end up being about trying to assuage that guilt. Positively or negatively, <laughs> right? I was, I was going to say that. <laughs> how, how, what about the interactions? But yes, it could be, it could go in either direction, yeah. and that's the one thing I always tell people that there is no shoulds about most of life. Yeah. There really isn't, because for some people it will go in a direction A, and for some people it will go in direction B, and they could be from the same roots. Yeah. So some pe- people would then overly pamper their children there's no structure no discipline the child is able to do what they want when they want as they want Mm -hmm. you know Um, and then the others who become very rigid or very strict because they think okay i'm not around all the time when i am around i need to make sure i teach them as much as i can about Mm -hmm. being you know proper ladies or gentlemen or Mm -hmm. whatever so it really could go in either direction as an overcompensation for the guilt that the mother may be feeling for being supposedly absent for some periods of time. So this thing about not being there for your children is very deep for a lot of mothers. Um, And sometimes you can feel as though your your children don't, you don't know your children as well as you hope you would. And um, when, especially when they get to teenage, but they are, you know, they are forming their own little identities. They are forming their own Even lives. Even for mothers who are present, they don't know the teenagers as yes. well as at, they at would some like point to, they start point. to grow on their in their own way, Wait, isn't yeah. it? And it's difficult to let go of those things sometimes. Even when you are as close as anything when they were growing up, but that's part of growing up. Yeah. When and and I always tell parents that honestly, if he, you've got that connection with your child and it's never late to, to develop that connection but when they know mommy is there or daddy is there let's let's include the men yeah. <laughs> when they know the parents are there even when they are doing their own things and growing in their own ways they know you are there and if they feel that the doors are open they will come, come to you when these kinds of things do happen so a lot of the guilt and and shame that we feel around parenthood is internally placed, but it is fed by what society expects. Sometimes those can be very harsh expectations, but yeah, that helps. That, that doesn't help with people's um, own own feelings of inadequacy or you know inca- being incapable of being present the way they want to be. How about a father who's not providing for his kids? Mm-hmm. Is there a sense of guilt there? There could be. There could be. And in particular, when the person has been raised in, the, in a way that emphasizes that as a man, you need to be the provider. Okay. You are the one who is the breadwinner of the home. Sometimes when you're not able to do it, when you're trying, but the money is just not stretching as you need it to. The ends are not meeting. They are not meeting, (laughs) right? It can result in a lot of guilt. And and you'll find that um, a lot of the male mental health challenges, not, they're not structured only around parenting, but it's around this sense of what, am I man enough? Because I'm not able to do A or B or C and things like that. And that can result in a lot of shame, a lot of guilt for not being what society deems you need to be. And that's how you've been raised or that's your perception of what, yeah, what it means to be a parent or I mean a father or a man generally. And that can result in quite a bit of guilt. Yeah. Okay. Sexual abuse victims? Yes, yes, of course. Um, mostly when we talk about sexual assault, we, we tend to emphasize the trauma aspect of it, which is the case. You, you need to deal with the trauma. But one of the things about the trauma is that it comes with quite a lot of guilt. Um, guilt because, for and I'm talking in the sense of women being victims of sexual abuse in this okay. case, um, that's not to say men are not victims sometimes, but the, in this case, I'm, I'm emphasizing on the women. Um, most people's uh, initial reactions or initial questions will be, what were you doing there? What were you wearing? Why did you not, I don't know, fight harder, try and run away, whatever? And it's not always from a place, a negative place. Right. People may think they are helping by trying to help you to think, okay, in case this is going to happen again, I should do this or I shouldn't do that. Um, of course, there are those judgmental ones as well, but it isn't always the case that is from a place of judgment. judgment. 
Um, so there's a lot of guilt already. Like, did I encourage this person in some way? Did I send the wrong message? Did I, should I have presented myself differently so that he wouldn't think it was, it, there was an opportunity for him to assault me? But then also importantly, the area that a lot of people tend to find guilt in is the fact that sometimes the body responds even when it's assault, you know? I mean, as I was saying, the, the, the whole idea of sex has been consumed with the fluttery feelings, the exciting whatever. And so um, abuse is seen as something that doesn't have that. Yeah. But at the root or at the core of it, sex is a physiological process as well. Very, very physical as well. And so there's a physiological component. Now, the emotional side of it can enhance the physiological component. But we are made of flesh and blood, isn't yes. it? Yeah. And so when there is a situation of assault, a sexual abuse, sometimes some women respond, their bodies respond. Yeah. You'll find that they um, they become um, wet, they, they some, some of them climax, right? Yeah. And then you start to think of yourself as being, having contributed to what you experienced. Yeah. Why did I respond? Why did my body respond? It must mean that there's a part of me that wanted this or a part of me that encouraged this. And that can be so heavy to carry because yeah. you feel guilty for what is meant to be something, something that something was a bad violation. That a violation of you. Yes. And it's almost like you participated, a, 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 yes. you know, and even though I was fighting I, and in my mind, I was trying to kick this person off or get away from this situation. But my body betrayed me in a way because it responded, which must mean that there, there may be a part of me that actually wanted it. When in, the, in actual fact, the truth is, it's just purely a physiological response Absolutely. so people can carry a lot of guilt with that as well which then needs to be managed carefully okay yeah right. so i mean i think just talking about guilt the way we've talked about it what i glean from this is yes it could be things that you've done but it's even your experiences can build some level of guilt yeah for you yeah. right yeah Okay, so let's, let's kind of go into shame a bit, mm -hmm. um, unpacking shame a bit more and understanding what experiences drive shame. Mm -hmm. So if you were to think about w what, hap what, what fuels shame in us, what comes to your mind? I think a lot of it is about what we think, what is our ideal self? I mean, uh, there's a psychologist called Young, Carl Young, who talks about archetypes. Everybody has, I won't go into all of no, that, <laughs> but everybody has. We've got time. Um, <laughs> I think it can be boring. So <laughs> let's not bore your viewers in going into a whole psychology lesson. Yeah. But I just want to explain with the issue of archetypes. We've got a sense of what we need to be or what we are. And if that doesn't match with what we think we should be, that sometimes there's a, some conflict. And one of the ways that conflict shows up is shame. So it's like an ideal self and your real self. Yes, what, that's where we're going to Rogers. Yeah, yeah, your psychology is showing. Eh? That's Rogers' idea of who everybody has an ideal self. We think we should be a certain size. We think we should maybe be, even be a certain height. We should have a certain kind of smarts or intelligence. We should be, in terms of our workplace, we should be a certain way in terms of our relationships. We should be, we have pictures of who we think. And, and sometimes these things go from Hollywood when we watch things on TV. Maybe so. uh, and it's not bad. It's not bad. It gives us something to work towards, right? But when you consistently feel that you are flawed and you're not meeting what you think you need to be, and that's the message that, first of all, you are getting from yourself, yeah. Yeah. which then can be reinforced by society, by the things people say, the things they expect, the utterances sometimes. People make all sorts of utterances sometimes unknowingly or very flippantly and then they're on their way but people carry those words along they feel what they feel the barbs still okay. even after you have left then we start to develop a, a sense of inadequacy a sense of self-worth we we measure ourselves against that ideal either self or what what we are seeing as the ideal person we may have somebody in mind that we admire and I should be more like them and I should be there. And I keep this, this word should is one that I think we, we use too much 
to weigh ourselves down. And so when we when we um we have that idealized perception of what we should be then almost everything we do will be gauged against that ideal self and when we consistently fail or or sometimes we may even achieve it but then it's not enough no. for us yeah. you know because the goal keeps getting shifted the goal post keeps getting shifted then we we feel shame about who we are about what we are able to do what our capabilities are who who we are to others as well we feel Absolutely. that kind of shame okay. yeah so so do personal insecurities play a role in 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 in, in, shame. in building shame yes yes okay. you know the way we grow up makes a big difference it, it builds a foundation and it builds a foundation of belief systems right not beliefs in terms of religion per se but beliefs about who we are who we yeah. who we must be as children or as um yeah children of our parents or as siblings our beliefs about who we should be as a spouse or a partner and as a parent as an employee all those all those belief systems of who we are or who yeah. we need to be yeah. they grow and develop in us as we grow up you know and if they they are not properly reinforced then they can become faulty or in a way what we would call maladaptive it okay. doesn't doesn't help you to thrive it rather tends to sort of pull you down so for instance if there's a, a young girl or a young child who is always told she's she must be smart enough she's been compared to her classmates or her her younger siblings or whoever else is and then she either starts to walk away with this sense of i can never get it right i'm not good enough or i'm not good enough or i need to make sure that i'm always better than someone else you know yeah. and that may push the person to to work very hard but for the wrong reasons because there's a feeling of inadequacy if there's any perception that somebody's better than me you know so those things build up our insecurities and that then makes us feel ashamed of who we are it's not always visible or it's not always conscious many times that we don't even really think through what our childhood experiences mean or what they in, what they are the ways in which they influenced us as adults um but then if you unpack it a bit you realize that there's always this kind of need for the person to shine in the ways that they have deemed appropriate got it So I was thinking about just my personal experience of times when I felt shame. Mm-hmm. Um and I think that one of the things that has fueled shame for me is keeping something in the dark. Okay. So and I kind of feel like once it's exposed then I don't feel anything about it anymore. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. So I don't know if keeping secrets is also something that feeds shame. So like I'm going through something, society has a view about that thing, right? Mm-hmm. And so I kind of don't talk about it. I minimize it. I hide it, right? Mm-hmm. But the moment I have the, I must have the courage and I say, "You know what? This is what the reality is." Mm-hmm. Then suddenly It doesn't feel so heavy. It doesn't feel so heavy anymore. Yeah. yeah. So there's hiding, minimizing, keeping secrets is that I don't know, it's just me trying to understand. I think in some circumstances it may okay. it, um, or it could. Okay. Um because we as I mentioned earlier, we tend to present a nicely put together Packaging. front. Yes. <laughs> but then it's not something that can always be hidden right? right i mean i can give the example of myself being somebody who is bigger you can't hide it everywhere okay. you go people see you you're plus size you're fat you're whatever and people could say all these things so it's not something you can hide okay. but um when there are things that are not so openly visible then uh, that are hidden people struggle with in the dark then it could feed the shame in that in that direction but it doesn't have to only be when it's secretive okay. it's it's something that it, it, what what happens with shame is that it's it's all about how you appraise yourself Self. 
Okay. And your appraisals could be based on what is said to you loudly, but it could also be based on the things that you experience in private that other people may not know about. And so, you tell yourself as well, the things that you tell yes, yourself. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so if you, you your appraisal tends to always come across to yourself as wrong or as flawed or as missing something, then, then the shame can thrive and it can get more firmly rooted. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, I think we talked about it a bit earlier on in terms of shame probably not being, and guilt not being part of the primary emotions, but yeah. it being um, secondary. Mm -hmm. um, it would be good to kind of understand when we be, at what point in time is it instilled in us, right? So, okay. yeah. Okay. When does it come alive in, in us as people? Uh, in very likely some elements of it in our first year of life. Really? Yeah, some elements so? of it. Because we, we respond to babies in certain ways. So mm -hmm. when the baby does something wrong, our, our actions or our reactions to the things they do can foster a sense of shame. Okay. Um, I don't know. You just change the, the, the baby's diaper and he's pooped again. I mean, and you say, <laughs> ah, again, <laughs> I just changed you. For some people, well, yeah, I did what it's I had to do, yeah. right? <laughs> but for some people, they feel guilty or they feel ashamed that they, 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 they are causing the stress or whatever to the parents. Yeah. Um, so there but are all that sorts young of age, limit. Is that a, at that young age, they begin to feel that? There are schools of thought that think so. Okay. There are schools of thought that things, I'm not sure we've been able to prove it, okay. right? But what I mean is that p these little things start to build a sense of what you should be and what is wrong for you, how you are wrong when, gotcha. when you do gotcha. or you behave in certain ways. And, and the person starts to, to get socialized in terms of even the language. And it's not always directed di at the children or the babies directly. They see how you interact with maybe their siblings, how uh, when adults are talking, the things they talk about within the first two, three years of life, yeah, when they're starting absolutely. to understand things a little more. They may not understand everything in the ways that adults do. Okay. But one thing I always say is that ch children experience the big emotions. Yeah. They don't always know what to do with it that that's the thing that's what we need to be able to teach them or to help them to learn um so yes shame starts off from from our early life okay. what what um sometimes becomes problematic is if it isn't taught properly yes right. right so it's not wrong to feel shame it's all of these emotions are survival instincts in us in a lot of ways so it's not wrong to feel shame it's what happens with the shame what you do with it what you do with it or what you do after you feel it does or after it cause you recognize reform? it does it exactly does the introspection get you to start thinking about things differently exactly things like that yeah how do you make it work for you in a lot of ways as well you know okay. it's what you do with it and it's same with guilt it's not wrong to feel the guilt if it fuels you to look at your behaviors your reactions the things you would like to improve in your life and all of that they can be useful they are functional emotions they help us navigate this world but when it is made to to look um like something that is that we should be ashamed of <laughs> to use the same, <laughs> same words, words right but something that is wrong something that um, um speaks to the core of your identity or your sense of self and that sometimes becomes very deeply rooted uh, many people who experience shame about certain things particularly with the way they look it comes from very deeply rooted things that may have been said or done to them over the years you know so the shame becomes twisted. The, the sort of positiveness of the shame becomes twisted and it becomes something that weighs them down and prevents them from actually growing right, properly. Lovely. Yeah. So when you think about shame and guilt, and you can pick either one, either one how, do, how do these emotions impact our relationships, be it you know, marriage relationships, work relationships, mm. friendships, mm. Um, relationships with our parents. Yeah. How, how, could you give examples of how these emotions could show up and impact these yeah. relationships? Yes, of course. Because when you think about 
feeling ashamed about who you are or something about yourself, mm -hmm. it certainly influences the extent to which you would allow people in. And, and so you may not be, if, let's, let's use you feeling a certain type of way about your body. Yeah. You think you're too big or you're too small, you're too short, you wish your hair was different, your eyes were different. It's a whole manner of things that we want especially for we, women would want to look like or to, we would want for ourselves. It means that you can potentially but limit. But these guys are... On the bandwagon, yes. Yes. they're doing um, lipo and all sorts yes. of things. So I, it's interesting. I was having a conversation with someone the other time, that I, and I was telling them that every time I go to do it to get a pedicure, a most of there. the time, like people around me are guys. Mm. So we shouldn't think these things don't matter to guys. Society tells us that we talk about it more, right? Yes. But in some ways, there are also guys who think about yeah. the way they look, and our words cut them as well. Absolutely. You know, when people make fun of them, look at your head, look at your beard look at your nose all of those things it cuts them as yeah. well everybody wants to be thought of as attractive yeah. or somebody that others want to to be around you know so when we we feel we don't have those qualities that we wish we had or that somebody else who seems very popular has um, we, we may not engage as much with the people around us. So our, our sense of building friendships may be different. Doesn't mean we won't make friends at all. Sometimes you get some friends who just won't let you go. <laughs> they are there whether you respond from positively or not, right? So those are also the, um, they are, they are, they are possibilities. But the, the extent to which we allow them in to actually build those friendships where they know us, we, we can feel vulnerable with them. They can feel vulnerable because they know, they, they know we'll be there with them. They understand who we are. Sometimes it's not ideal Understood. because the person hasn't learned how to do that. In relationships, it's also creates a, a big issue. And when you think about the way we are socialized about sex in this country, as, not just in this country, but as women, there's a lot of shame sometimes in terms of what, you sh what is okay for you to ask of your partner mm -hmm. or your spouse when you are together. Not many women are comfortable initiating sex. They are not comfortable asking for sex. Trying different things, things, you yes. know, they are not comfortable. Or even saying or, how they feel about something in particular. Yes, right? that this feels it, nice yes, to me yes. or pleasurable. Keep doing that yes. or don't do this or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not something that I've talked about. And then they feel shame if they even think they, they should ask that. You get those who say, I don't care, I'm going to be the one. And sometimes those also go the extreme yeah. of being very risky in yeah. some of their sexual behaviors. So all of those things also happen. So it affects our romantic relationships as well. Because the thing with a romantic relationship is that both of you want to connect. You want to... I, I would like my vulnerabilities to be supported by your strength yes. and in the other way and as well. Versa. You see what I mean? And then we form a, a connection or a partnership which helps us both shine. It's not always going to be all glossy yeah. and glamorous, but we want that process to be in it together. Yeah. And many people who carry a deep sense of shame, a deep sense of a low self-esteem as a result of that shame, will struggle with those kinds That's of right. behaviors and okay. those kinds of connections. And of course, in the workplace. Yeah. yeah, if you're ashamed because you think I must, and this is the thing with what we call imposter syndrome. A lot of us struggle with it, don't we? Because... When we go to the interviews, you should, you should see my ear. Yes, I can turn my ear in this way. <laughs> I know we all struggle with it, right? Because we go for interviews and we we sell ourselves. This is the way we've been trained. You have to make them think what a what an amazing person. person you will be on the team, and all the wonderful things you are going to be bringing on board. Which sometimes is the case, but sometimes we oversell it, <laughs> and then suddenly we are stuck with a situation where. I need to show these people all the wow factor yes, that I me. presented, yeah. you know? And so every day going to work, you feel a sense of guilt or sometimes shame when you feel you haven't been able to meet those expectations. So it affects us in our workplace as well. Yeah. Now, as I said, it's not wrong to feel sh shame or guilt. It's about what you do with it. So when, when you feel this apprehension about, ah, I said I, I could do this or I could do that, or I could be this person or that person to whoever, 
Um, it's what you do with it. What what does that make you do? Does it make you try and learn how to actually do what you said you could do? Does it make you try and open up to your spouse or your partner to say, I'm struggling with this aspect of myself? That yeah. What it makes you do okay. is what makes the difference. Yeah. So yes, shame starting from our childhood built into us from the reactions of the, our loved ones or the networks that are immediately around us first and then our school networks and so on. It builds up if we don't learn how to manage it into the kinds of relationships we have as adults. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> so taking that in terms of into the kinds of relationships we have as adults, how does shame show up in adults, right? Um, and how does it impact you living a full life? Okay. So let's, let's look at some examples yeah. uh, off the top of my head. If someone is not able to build friendships, yes. they are the kind that would, you would struggle to find your space or your, your place. So in the community or maybe in your church or in your workplace, wherever your, your social networks are, you might be seen as a bit of an odd person because you stick to yourself, right? Yes. Or sometimes the other way around, the person is, very bubbly and loud, but doesn't actually connect with, with anybody. Yeah. You know, and sometimes that's a way to cover up their feelings of inadequacy. They make yeah. a lot of noise. Everybody sees them and all, but nobody actually knows them. Yeah. Nobody yeah. knows what is it about Lily or Ikua or whoever, whoever mm. it is. Um, because you you are not able to build those connections because you're worried that the person seeing, uh, coming close to me will make them see Who me. you are and not probably might not like you or probably might and not see my flaws. flaws. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. see my flaws, all the things that it takes all of this effort to gloss over and present myself very nicely. If I allow anyway. somebody in, <laughs> <laughs> if I allow somebody in, they're actually going to see that, huh, actually Lily doesn't have it all together. She's actually somebody who isn't always nice. <laughs> so it's actually easier to be this gregarious person, life of the party, and not connect, actually build any real meaningful yeah. connection. For some people, yes. For some people. Or well, for some people, they, 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 are, they are sort of checked out of life, right? You'll be in church every week for the two hours or whatever. And when they close, you're straight in your car and you're gone. Or you come to work, you do what you need to do. Questions are asked of you. You'll answer them well enough, not rudely or anything, but nobody actually knows you. Yeah. I have to say that for some people, that's just the way they are. Yeah. It doesn't mean everybody who is like this is dealing with or is struggling with shame. shame. For some people, that's just the, the way, way they they, re they relate. Um, but then for some people, it might be the, the situation that it's a way to cover up the way they are feeling. Okay. Another example might be if you are thinking about um, being in a partnership, like I mentioned, how do you negotiate sex? How do you talk about intimacy? How do you relate with your partner about the things that the crazy or wild things that maybe you saw somewhere you thought maybe we can try but, but then okay. <laughs> but then you yeah, are meant to be maybe a christian sister that's how we met and married you are meant to be this prayerful brother who shouldn't be thinking about crazy things like that. Um, but even beyond that, it's even the simple things of even conversations. Mm -hmm. How can you relay with your partner the things that made you sad or frustrated or the, the things you're vul feeling vulnerable about? Maybe you've got a difficult relationship with your parents. Uh, is your partner the space where you can openly talk about those things and not feel as though I need to be the perfect wife for him. I need to come across as supportive of his needs and all of that. Or so, even the yeah. fear that that would be used against you. Or the fear. Exactly. Exactly. Because once those flaws are identified, some, even the relationship is toxic, then you know that it will be, it will come back at you in some way. way. But it may not be toxic from their perspective. Maybe it's you. That yeah. even if the intention is not to talk about that in a, a manner that is degrading, once the person says anything that is remotely related to what you shared with them, you say, yeah, yeah. you're using it against yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it really affects our ability to build connections with people if we don't recognize and manage these emotions. Yeah. Yeah. Does it, when you think about our self-worth um, and people who are constantly seeking some kind of approval, mm -hmm. 
could shame be one of the things that we carry or one would carry that would kind of impact your self-worth to the point where you constantly want some kind of validation? Yes. Or yes. For some people, that's how it plays out because mm. they, um, they may have had experiences growing up or in school or wherever where um, they were made to feel ashamed for thinking certain ways or for, mm. for expressing certain thoughts. Um, and they may have that one person or a few people who always made them feel like, oh, don't worry, you're good enough. So you stay, you cling to those people, don't yeah. you? Because yeah. we all want to feel good about ourselves. But sometimes when we externalize it so much that we only feel good about ourselves when someone else says it, then it becomes a, a problem because yeah. we've got to also learn internal ways of validation for ourselves. So people may be carrying shame about not being able to internally validate themselves. That in itself okay. can it's be a, a source of shame. Yeah. And because many people recognize when they need that external validation, not everybody, but some people do recognize it. And so then feel as though, why can't I do this for myself? So. And if this person is not around, I feel inadequate. I yeah. feel as though I can't really judge whether I'm doing it okay or I'm, I'm worth what I'm trying to do and all of that. So it, it plays out in different ways. Okay. Myths. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so there are myths about everything. Yes. There are myths about sex. There are myths about love. There are myths about how to grow in your career successfully. And there are myths about shame. Yeah. I have a whole list of my own myths. <laughs> what myths do you have? Okay. Um, first of all, the fact that you shouldn't, you should never feel shame, I think is a myth. Yeah. Um, because it's it's an inborn emotion. We it's something that is within us. Yeah. It's, it usually becomes a problem, as I said, when we don't manage it properly. Then it can drive our behaviors in, in ways that may be maladaptive. Correct. So it's not a myth. I mean, it is a myth that you should never feel shame. If you, if you know who you are, if you are confident in yourself, if you, you know, if, if you are a Christian and you believe in who has saved you and all of those, so you should never feel ashamed. I think that's a myth. It's not okay. something that um, is realistic because okay. it puts a lot of pressure on people and make, make them actually feel inadequate yeah. when they do feel the shame. Um, sometimes also, we, I think it's also a myth when people say that when you feel shame, it's all consuming. Okay. You know, just because you're feeling shame, it means that it's coloring everything about you. It's not quite the case because you could feel very confident in yourself in one space, but very ashamed or unsure of yourself in another, another space. True. Yeah. Somebody may know who, who they are and what they are about in their workplace. They are the boss. They are the boss, boss lady. They're capable, yeah? they're get yeah. everything done. But then they come home and as a parent or as a spouse or partner, or whatever it is, or even as a child to parents who may be domineering, and they, everything they do is, 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 not good enough. is not good enough, or they feel like it's not good enough. And so it's not the fact that you feel you have low self-esteem and it covers everything about you. But sometimes there are areas where people may feel strongly about it. And when you, you know you've got it together in one area and you're struggling in another, that can even heighten the feeling of shame. It's like, why can I not get this yes, together here? Exactly. I'm this strong person. I'm this capable, exactly. competent person in all these other yeah. areas in my life. And I know it here. And I know it here. Mm -hmm. I know what I need to do here. Yes. But I can't seem to get a grasp of exactly. myself. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's not it's a myth that once you feel shame, it means you know everything about you is coloured by that shame. Yeah. So a myth: my needs are unreasonable. Yes, that's also a myth. Okay. That's also a myth because everybody has certain things that they need in order to feel secure in their personal space and also to feel a part of things, either a work relationship or a romantic relationship or family or whatever it is. So it isn't unreasonable to have certain needs. Um, sometimes some people can be overly dependent on other people and that's where sometimes it can be confused with 
needs being unreasonable. Yeah. Uh, you've got to learn how to overcome that dependency. It doesn't make the needs invalid, it, invalid, but it rather means you need to learn how to manage those needs. So the needs are never unrealistic. There's something wrong with me. I'm flawed. My body is flawed. The way I think is flawed. Yeah, that's also a big myth. Okay. A big myth because everybody has parts they don't like or they wish were different. But it doesn't mean everything about you is flawed. Okay. And even the parts that you don't like, you learn to work with them. <laughs> you learn to to make them to thrive despite those things, right? There's no such thing as perfection okay. in this fallen world that we live in. <laughs> I like the description, fallen world. <laughs> yes, because you keep going in and it's sometimes how people get um, addicted to, to cosmetic surgery. Yeah. You know, it's not wrong to do cosmetic surgery. You want to nip here and tuck there and do all of those little nip things. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> hey, everybody has their thing. But the thing is, sometimes once you start to see, ah, this actually looked better. Maybe if I go a little smaller and a little smaller and a little smaller and a little smaller, and oh, I change this addictive. aspect and that aspect. Yeah. And, and so even in the search for perfection, we never get there. There should, be, there should be like a cut-off point at some point. At in some time. point, yeah. yes. <laughs> Breaking cycles of shame. So I, 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 I believe that, you know, you might have different things that you're ashamed about and with different levels of intensity. Mm -hmm. um, you might feel shame about, you know, not having time for your, for your family the way you'd want to. Mm -hmm. Or you might feel shame because you don't have a degree or you might feel shame because um, uh, something went belly up at work because yeah. of you, whatever. Yeah. So it's different. But there'll be different levels of intensity for these yes. different things, right? Yes. But I think that I've also found in my conversations with different people that the people who feel a lot more shame and are more sensitive to things mm -hmm. than some others mm -hmm. would generally be. Mm -hmm. What would you tell, how would you caution someone or how would you advise someone to break a cycle of shame? Okay. I think the, the first thing, and actually for, the, I, I told myself this year, my buzzword is self-awareness. Okay. Right? It is the beginning of a lot of things. Once you recognize what it is that you're going through, you're experiencing, you're struggling with or whatever it is, then it, it is a big chunk of the work done because we operate sometimes without recognizing what drives our, be, our behaviors. Understood. So it's the same with shame. You've, need, you, you've got to unearth it. You need to see it for what it is. You need to reflect and, and, and introspect and, and think about what is it that I'm feeling and why or in what circumstances am I feeling those things? If you notice that when, whenever you are in, at work and you are required to do a certain presenta um, a, a presentation, you feel a certain way afterwards because you think, oh, I should have done this, I should have done that, I should have done that. Then maybe one of the areas that you need to think about is what, why am I feeling ashamed of my work skill? Yeah. What is it that I think is inadequate? What is missing? You know, so first unearth what it is what the roots of it are and that takes a bit of reflecting sometimes you may need some support or some guidance but support really from? from trusted people or professionals okay. sometimes not just anybody because there are some people who can make the situation worse okay. you may you may trust them in terms of them being let's say your closest friend or no but if the person isn't very sure what to do they, they could potentially dig Create you more, deeper. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you've got to think carefully about who you reach out to for help. Um, but yeah, so as I said, breaking the cycle means first recognizing or being self-aware about how I feel about who I am and what I'm capable of doing. Um, sometimes with help, but even without the help on our own through thinking it through and reflecting, we can start to look at why I feel this way? Why yes. do I think I'm inadequate? What yes. is it that I think is missing? And why do I think um, it is? Why do I think it is? Yes. yes. Because most of the time, the, the crippling nature of things like shame and guilt result from the way in which we, um, we, we f f exaggerate 
or overly magnified small flaws. Small, yeah. Right? Yeah. We we minimize the positives and, and it's a form of cognitive distortion. We minimize what is positive, we maximize what is negative. That is the way we've operated. And so, so we I'll continue. Tell you a quick story. The first time I ever <laughs> went in, went into therapy, um, the therapist gave me a coin mm. and says put it against the sun mm. and close one eye and then do this mm. right mm. and guess what this <laughs> coin covers the, the whole sun yes right yes but the sun is this massive exactly element yeah. right and the lesson there was that the coin is such a small thing yeah but depending on how you frame things and you look at things, exactly. this small, tiny speck is able to cover this bright light that's yeah. the sun, right? Yeah. And so sometimes it's important to put things in perspective and see. Yes. Yeah, so that's, yes, that's what you're saying. Absolutely. That's the fantastic way of looking at it, you <laughs> yes. know? And the thing with these kinds of ways of thinking is that as we've lived our lives growing up or going through life, it becomes almost automatic to us yeah. because we've done that often yeah. and it becomes our norm or our go-to. So something happens and it's immediately, what did I do wrong? Why can't I get it right? I'm always yeah. doing these things wrong. Yeah. But you don't see the positive so much. And so sometimes it takes an intentional intentionality of identifying okay what was what actually went right yes now I'm automatically I've been able to list all the things that went wrong but what is it that I did right and using a, a sort of um, dispassionate lens if you if you if you like are to, we able to do that it takes practice that's the thing it <laughs> takes practice because you've had years to develop the habit of maximizing yeah, the negative yeah, yeah. it takes practice to be intentional about looking at the positive things yeah. um, to be purposeful about identifying what what is it that went well Got it. and mostly we look at we, 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 we try to teach people to um, challenge the negative thoughts What's the truthfulness of this? just because you're feeling it doesn't, doesn't make it right yes. so, so it, it's I'm a, I feel alone. Are you really alone? Exactly. And what feel, is it yeah. about being alone that makes you anxious? Yeah. You know, what's yeah. the truthfulness of that? Yeah. So then if you, you start to assess those kinds of things, you can find a bit of a balance in the sense that, well, okay, maybe I should have added A, B, and C to my presentation at work. Yeah. But well, I did talk about D, E, and F. And I said, the, if people had other questions, they could get in touch. So, so I can the, tell them the, about A, B, and C, C. Yes. right? It's things like that. Yes. If you let your mind go on and on, it will- it Lead will you down a rabbit hole. I like it that way. I think you just summarized yeah. it very nicely. Yeah. It absolutely would lead you down a rabbit hole that sometimes it's very difficult to climb out wow. of, you yeah. know? And so there has to be a, an intentionality about first accepting, okay, I'm feeling ashamed about this or about myself in this way. Why am I feeling this way? What is the truthfulness of what I'm feeling? And what are other ways I can think about what this, whatever triggered that feeling of shame? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and just even sometimes if there is an action that resulted in that guilt or shame that you're feeling, even the acceptance of it, yes. right? I did this. I yes. made a mistake. Yes. And, and sometimes being gentle on yourself exactly. and being forgiving yourself exactly. could, be, could be something that you do as a, as a yes. way of easing yourself out of out of precisely some of, out, out, out of some of yeah that. because if it were, were someone else we may be a bit kinder you extend more show more grace yeah 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 than ourselves yeah. because we've got this sense of i need to have it together and and sometimes those have been ways that we've survived or gotten to where we needed to be yeah. but sometimes they become a crutch because we we do not want to accept that I actually am not superwoman. Sometimes I make mistakes, you know, and when I make mistakes, it hurts. And 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 sometimes there are mistakes that have really deep consequences. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that that is the end of your life. Right. That's the thing that we need to accept. 
you made this mistake. Sometimes you have to grovel to make penance for your mistake. It doesn't mean that you as a person then suddenly becomes useless or worthless. You know, we've got to strike that balance because our lives are not made up of the totality of our mistakes. It's the things that we want to achieve that we work at more. It's, it, it's almost like having, and, and I always call it, having that board meeting with yourself. Yes. yes. Where you have a conversation with yourself and ask yourself some of the critical questions. And it's almost like when you ask yourself why, why, why repeatedly enough, you get to the point where you, understand, you realize yeah. that it's actually not as significant as you thought it exactly. was. And your mind has magnified it beyond yeah. what it should yeah. be. And, and uh, the thing is that it doesn't always happen just like that. Takes time. We don't always have an aha moment. Sometimes you do get them and those are nice, right? Yeah. You do get that moment like, huh, so this thing, actually it's nothing, yeah. right? Or it's not as big as I thought it was. Sometimes we do get it, but sometimes it's the little, little steps. It takes us a little bit of time to feel comfortable, to say, okay, you let me try again. Uh, I'm going to keep trying or keep going. And then eventually you realize, oh, this thing that I was feeling, some Way, or some way about it's actually not the way it is okay. so it sometimes takes many steps and us reflecting and thinking it through doesn't mean that we'll immediately see what the the bounds of our shame or our guilt look like but it would mean that sometimes you've opened that door so your mind can ruminate or it can think it through it can you know moments where sometimes you're asleep and you're like ha ah, so after all this is what it is this, this is the yeah, bottom line yeah. for me you know it's allowing that process to happen to recognize that I'm trying to figure it out as we go along it doesn't it shouldn't stop me I'll try my best in these other ways I come back and I reflect and think about what did I do what did I do differently this time? How have I improved? Where, which other areas do I think I would want to try again or try in different ways and so on? So it's really, like you said, a board meeting with yourself, a daily conversation with your thoughts and your emotions yeah. to think about how did it go today? What did I do that I thought I, I should be proud of myself for trying or for moving beyond? And which areas do I think tomorrow I want to try again? Yeah. I have a thought for you. Okay. So... Someone I know and I were having a conversation about what makes guilt and shame such powerful emotions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came up was how they're both self-driven emotions. And so because a lot of it is from your evaluation of things yeah. and from your point of knowledge a lot of the time um, it makes it powerful but at the same time there are also emotions that can be externally in incited right yes so someone else could say to you you did this wrong you are the cause of yeah. xyz you should be ashamed of you yourself you should be ashamed of yourself mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but the self-driven nature of these emotions also may mean that you have to be reflective yes and so they don't always happen spontaneously. Exactly. And sometimes it takes time, you go back and forth, you reflect, and then there's a delayed reaction sometimes mm -hmm. where six months later you think, oh, yeah. I could have been nicer to Lily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And sometimes it might be through your own experiences yeah. or through reflection or yeah. because you've had time, yes. right? To remove the layers of emotions that were surrounding a particular situation yeah. and so on. Mm. I want us to talk a little bit about how powerful these emotions mm. are from this lens, right? And what that means to the everyday person, mm. Mm. right? Mm. Because one, it being self-driven, but also being, it could, like being externally motivated, right? Mm -hmm. How does one realize the power in this mm -hmm. and use it positively for themselves and for those around them? Okay. You see, and, and I agree with you absolutely about it being self-driven. And uh, although sometimes externally um, uh, incited, when you've got a situation where you 
you know you you feel badly about yourself or about your behavior you know in a way that those feelings will come yeah if you feel ashamed about the way you lead your team at work for instance yeah. and you've got a team meeting coming up you know after the meeting you'll start to feel shame or guilt or whatever emotions you're struggling with in that sense one of the first ways that you break the back of those kinds of things is to recognize the power that it has over you and therefore anticipating it um anticipating it coming helps to break that power okay uh, often you'll find that happening mostly with things that create anxiety for people but yeah. it's a similar thing with with feeling guilty about things because you know it will come if you have a fear of you have a phobia for going outside but you need to go outside for whatever reason telling yourself that okay i know i'm going to go these symptoms are going to come i'm going to have shortness of breath i'm going to start palpitating my my um, i'm going to be sweating all of those things you know they are coming so it's like an unwanted guest that you can get rid of you know the person is coming that helps to reduce its power over you it helps so you regulate why, almost to a certain bit. yes because you know i can't stop it from coming but i will work through it like i've worked through in the past i've gotten through it uh, previously let it come yes. i will deal with it because i can't run away from it unfortunately when it's a situation that you can't avoid <clears throat> that's where this thing about self awareness comes again that if you know this is something you struggle with then in the situations where those uh, feelings tend to come up you in a way psych yourself up, up. to to meet it. Yeah. That's the first thing. And that's where you start to remove some of its power. Okay. The self-driven nature is such that I I always tell people that you do not have any control over other people's behaviors. None. Right? Except yours. You only can control your reactions to the things they do. Okay. And that's a similar thing with feeling guilty or feeling ashamed about things. You you only have control over how you react to it and that is a learned response it's got to be something you learn how to do by identifying the things that trigger it by identifying what your reactions tend to be and by learning to to sometimes physically tell yourself lily stop it like you are spiraling <laughs> why are you going round and round about this thing just stop yeah. sometimes you need to talk to yourself like you would yeah. your inner child as they say right and that would break the power that it has over you not all at once but it takes practice yeah. sometimes there, there there are some situations that sometimes it takes several years of small 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 incremental steps and before you know it is not even a problem anymore without you even realizing it you know okay. so the the external valid sorry the external inciting that we talked about you don't you can't always control what people say to you or they say about you but you can control the way in which you let it define who you absolutely. are you can absolutely. absolutely control because the person does not know your reality the same way you do you live your life you know what it it is to be you <laughs> so you can control the extent to which their words hit you Sometimes controlling it means learning to ignore but sometimes it means learning to speak up and having the right response having the right response because some, we can sometimes make situations worse if we do not re react properly right so the person may be bullying you but if your response is to hit them back it, it doesn't it just, always it just spirals it, exactly and you just create a situation a very toxic situation where each person is getting there trying to get the other person back right but if you learn how to respond um to what the person is doing and look for openings where you can either address it or get somebody else who may, may have some influence over the person to intervene or whatever then that breaks that cycle so when you're feeling guilty based on the things that people are saying you should have done or you shouldn't have done and you feel as though it is um crippling you the power of the weight of that guilt makes you feel as though well then what's the point i'm not i can't do anything about it. i've made this terrible mistake then you need to start to think of the things that drive your own sense of behavior or of, of what you think you need to do or you need to be and that's where you take some of that power back because allowing the person's words to dump in your morale so much gives them too much power over you 
right? And in the same way that you can control other people's behaviors, they shouldn't be able to control your behavior. So you take back some of that power and it starts to break the back of these kinds of emotions. Yeah. Understood. <laughs> Is having a conscience a prerequisite to experiencing guilt? Yes and no. Okay. <laughs> it seems like most of my answers are yes and no and nowadays. <laughs> because I always say that it's always there's there's no, should, there's no eh? absolutes, right? Yeah, there should. To a large extent, yes. What you feel guilty about or what you feel ashamed of is based on what your mind tells you you should be like or you should behave like. Um, and so particularly with something like guilt, it is driven by our, our moral um, expectations of ourselves and even of others, but especially of ourselves. So we, we expect that we behave in certain ways. What a good citizen is, a good spouse, a good parent or whatever. Those things eat at us when we think we've broken those rules. So our conscience comes into play because it helps us to appraise the rightfulness or wrongfulness of what we did or said or didn't do or whatever. And that helps to regulate the feelings that we have. So if your conscience is um, accusing you, you're more likely to feel it compared to if some random person is it's accusing telling you. you. Yeah. yeah, so it plays a big role. For some other people though, it's not about their conscience, it's about how they've been raised, the expectations that have been had of them. So it's not really about you being right or wrong, but it's about you being inadequate. You're not enough or you're not good enough. And that is not so much your conscience. It's, um, you, you see, your conscience is about morality, but shame has to do with your, your, in, in, your inner feeling about yourself. And it's not so... It's not about whether you're, you're, you are right or wrong. It's about whether you are enough or whether you are worthy or you know whether you are adequate and things like that. So okay. conscience plays some role, but not, not all the time. Okay. <clears throat> How do you rid yourself of feelings of guilt? That's, uh, again, not a one-time thing. Okay. Yes. A lot of the things that we have learned to become over the years we need to take the time to unlearn them. And that doesn't always happen overnight. Mm -hmm. But the reason why guilt tends to thrive for a lot of people is because um, the, the ways in which we have been socialized emphasizes taking responsibility. That is seen as a good person, right? Yeah. Someone who knows what their responsibilities are, who does them, who doesn't shirk responsibility, doesn't throw off things that they need to do onto others or, or avoids the things that they need to do, all those kinds of things. Once you, you start to recognize that actually responsibility includes a recognition of the limits of my behavior, mm -hmm. then you can start to throw off the guilt. So taking responsibility does not only have to be about I did it wrong, I, or I made this mistake, and therefore it's all consuming. Sometimes it's saying I, I didn't do well. I was feeling this way or that way, or I just didn't, I was just not in the mood for it. Maybe that could be the situation. But accepting that, okay, I will do better next time, or I'll make amends in the areas where I've made, I've made a, a mistake can help you to shake off the... Um, the guilt. So again, first recognize what it is. Recognize the limits of your responsibility. Be willing to forgive yourself for your mistakes and then be willing to make amends if you need to, but resolve to do better the next time. Guilt and shame are consuming emotions that often you need to set yourself free from mm -hmm. and only you can set yourself free from. Yes, yes. You can get all the support you need. You can get a professional to help, right? But at the end of the day, you have to do the work. The, that wellness or that um, state of being, it cannot be imposed on you. It's something you have to work at to get there. So yeah, it's, it's only you who can ensure that you, you Last shake Last question, off. because all these people have been looking at me and we're way <laughs> over. Um, looking at yourself in the mirror, mm -hmm. I think it's an important thing, right? To be able to look at yourself and be happy with what you see. Yeah. And often it means that you need to be aware of the truth about yourself and who you are mm -hmm. and what you feel about yourself. Mm -hmm. 
Any final comments? Yes, I agree. I agree. There, the, we won't always like what we see in the mirror all the time. But it's so important to look because you might see something that you do like that you didn't even notice. And it's so, so, so important for us to remember that we are our works in progress. Everybody, who we were, even as, 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 as um, recently as last year, we are not exactly the same way. We grow, we learn, we adapt, we, we change, you know, we evolve. So take a look in the mirror every once in a while and see what is in there. And if there are things that you think should be different or could be different, what do you need to do to make that difference? And how realistic is it to want those things to be different? I think that is where I can end things. <laughs> it's time for me to make you a cocktail. <laughs> do you have any requirements in that mm, cocktail? No, surprise me. I alcoholic, like to be surprised. Non-alcoholic. Whichever you bring. <laughs> Ooh, I like people like you. So to what I call the exciting part of all of this. Yes. I made your cocktail. Mm -hmm. Only one requirement. You're supposed to tell me two things in the cocktail. This okay. will be quite easy though. Okay. I can assure you. <laughs> so let's rock and roll. Don't tell me there's ice in it. <laughs> that was going to be my first. That's the cheat that everybody else does. So stir it up. Yes. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> oh. It should be so easy. <laughs> like I know it, right? But I can't I can't figure out what to call it. But some kind of juice. <laughs> I have this is, no this idea. is the best. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really spitballing here. Yeah, spitballing. <laughs> I have no clue. I just know it tastes good. <laughs> okay. Hmm. It just means that you're quite, like, you're not delinquent enough. <laughs> I really can't come to it. You can't come to it. Cheers. Mm -hmm. It was really lovely having you. We've had so you're not really going to tell me. I will, I will tell you in two seconds that you've got to beep it all out. So it's a coconut and pineapple base. It's a coconut I can taste. Yes, so that, I, don't I, taste thought you would, I thought you would taste yeah, the coconut I, immediately. I, I, that's what I'm saying. I know, I know it, but it just wasn't coming. And it's got... Okay. And then it's got a little bit of a, um, just a mm. little tad bit of. That I wouldn't have come to. No, you wouldn't have come to. No. But the rum, I would have thought you'd come to the I and the coconut. I thought too. Yes. I would have thought too. It's but a rock. Thank you. You're it's welcome, really my dear. <laughs>